Hi, I'm Pastor Scott, pastor of the Oasis Church. Listen, we are so excited that you decided to join us for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. We just pray that this will stir your affections towards Christ, but we have one encouragement we want to leave you with. Please do not allow this to take the place of the local body of believers. We pray that you will be involved in a local congregation, a local church that you can find yourself submitting under the eldership and the leadership of a local church. We pray that you will find yourself stirred towards Christ and that your joy in Christ will be ever increasing. Enjoy. As we continue our walk through the most amazing man to ever walk the face of the earth, we are reminded of what we saw last week. If you were with us last week, remember, we saw Jesus has radically shifted his ministry. He has now radically shifted the way in which he is going to do ministry. And how has he radically shifted? He is now going to speak only to the disciples in ways of parables. So realize this is a shift. And this is why we read the gospels over and over and over, because we'd start to see how how the Gospels have these different moves, these different shifts, and we notice it. Before Jesus started ta- teaching in parables, he grabbed the whole crowd and he taught to them plainly, and his teaching was accompanied by great mighty signs and works. And then we get to the pinnacle of his debate with the hard-hearted Pharisees, the incredulous Pharisees, and this is what they came to realize this one simple fact. Since Jesus is doing the work of casting out demons, and since he is not who they think he is, he therefore must be demon-possessed. This is hard-heartedness to be able to not see the work of God amidst ordinary and extraordinary circumstances. So how did the Pharisees have such a hard heart? How is it? because they wanted Jesus to do something he didn't actually come to do. They wanted Jesus, they wanted the Messiah to come in and be a political leader. They wanted him to come in and fix the government, to lower their taxes, to get Rome, to get the bad guys out of the government. That's what they thought Jesus was for. And what is he doing? None of that. He's not dealing with the Romans at all. Who's he dealing with? He's dealing with the most horrific of sinners. He's calling the sinners to himself and saying what? Eat with me. How terrible of a thing that is. This caused the Pharisees to have a hard heart. And this causes you and I to have a hard heart when Jesus doesn't do what we want him to do. Jesus isn't behaving the way I want him to behave. So what do we do? We harden our heart against him. This is how we got here. And as we saw it last week, Jesus has now shifted his ministry into a whole new ministry. He is now only speaking in parables. And what are the parables used for? He is separating the crowd from the disciples. He is separating the spurious believers, the false believers, the people who only want to come to Jesus for his stuff. He's separating them out and separating his true disciples to himself. What parables will ultimately do to the people is it'll do one of two things. It'll harden your heart against him or it'll soften your heart to understand him. This is Jesus's ministry. And this is weird for us, is it not? Because we hear this Jesus who stands and says, everyone comes, and what is Jesus doing? He's intentionally veiling his message against those who are not believers. This sounds weird, preacher. It doesn't sound like the Jesus who's this hippie Jesus inviting all people to come. That doesn't sound like him. This sounds like a hard Jesus. And here's what we realize. There is a difference between being a fan of Jesus and being a follower of Jesus. There is a radical difference between a fan of Jesus and a follower of Jesus. Jesus has plenty of fans. He has few followers. Matthew says it, Matthew quotes Jesus saying it this way, many are called, few are chosen. So what is the difference between the crowd and the disciple? The crowd cares about the flash of Jesus. They care only about what Jesus can give them. They care for the miracles of Jesus. They care that Jesus has come to make their life easier. That's what the crowd thinks. 
Yet they have no desire for Jesus' words, no desire for what he teaches, no desire to deny themselves, zero care in fighting sin through repentance. Seth said it, Seth said it right, Acts chapter 2, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized. John the Baptist preaching a message of what? Repentance, right? Repentance in keeping with fruit. This is a disciple. I am totally about denying myself. I must decrease so that he may increase. That's what a disciple is about. They want to go deeper. They're ferocious learners. They trust in the word of God. They love Jesus for who he is, not just for his stuff. I said it last week. I'll say it again. The fan of Jesus will say hallelujah. The disciple of Jesus will walk, a, walk out hallelujah. The fan will say hallelujah. The disciple will walk out hallelujah. The fans will have big talk, big promises, all words, no action. The disciples will walk out careful obedience, following their Lord even to the point of death. And this is what the parables did. They veiled Jesus' teaching to the crowd and revealed truth to the disciples. What does this look like today? This looks like a whole bunch of people when you put them together and they all hear the same sermon and they walk away with totally different reactions. This is the Spirit of God at work. And Jesus Christ and Him crucified is either what you cling on to, what you hold on to, your greatest hope and treasure, or it becomes just an add-on to your life, just a part of your life, and therefore will become unnecessary when things get difficult. And so Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 4 serves as a warning to us, friends, and hear me on this. Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 4 is a warning to pay attention to ourselves, to pay attention to how we respond to God's word. And the whole New Testament points to this. Just a few texts for you. Paul, 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourself to see if you are of the faith. First uh, Timothy chapter 6, Paul says, fight Timothy for the faith. And I love my man, Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, he says this, be diligent to confirm your election. What does diligent mean? It means this, work hard. Get to work. God doesn't operate of us sitting in a room, folding our arms and going, hoping it happens. It is us walking out the faith, the gift of God that has been thrust upon us and confirming our election. And why does the Bible tell us this? Why does Paul say this? Why does Peter want us to examine ourselves to see if we're of the faith? Why do they say that? Because you and I are so easily prone to self-deception, are we not? This is the essence of sin. I am my own God. I am king of my own life, and no one can tell me what to do. And so, therefore, this is how we interpret things. I know that if I knew something was wrong, I'd fix it. Therefore, there is nothing wrong since I have no desire to fix it. Do you see how wrong that thinking is? You are self-deceived, right? So the whole point we as Christians do is, man, we are so about what? Crucifying our flesh. Galatians 2.20, put to death the deeds of the flesh, right? This is the whole point of the gospel, the Christian walk. So, so how does that work, Pastor? How, how does that work itself out? Let me tell you what I do. Again, I'm not perfect. There's just one way you could do it. I'm sure you all have your ways in which you do it, but this is what I like to do. As I'm falling asleep, I've hugged my wife, said goodnight, right? That whole thing, and I'm falling asleep. This is what I like to do. I take a stock of my whole day and I ask myself, where did I waste God's time? If God, if this is God's world, if this is, if I'm God's, if I'm truly his servant, where did I waste God's time? And do you know what I find? I waste a lot of God's time. Just me. Okay, that's all right. Y'all are awesome. I get it. Cool. So look, maybe there's someone in here. You didn't say amen. All right, I'm going to talk to you for a moment. You and I waste a lot of God's time on temporal things that will inevitably burn on things that will not matter in two million years in the glory and the majesty of God. And so, man, what I want to do is I want to put that junk to death. 
so that the glory and the majesty of God may be seen for the whole world. And so guess what happens when I start to take that stock? Man, I start to beat myself up, right? Such a loser. But here's what actually happens. The gospel starts to take root. And it says what? There is, thou, there is now therefore no condemnation for in Christ Jesus. What does the Bible say? That Christ's mercies are new when? Every morning. So when I wake up, now I'm preaching to myself. I'm going, all right, God, I'm living today for you. God, don't let me get into nonsense time of this world. But God, let me be on purpose for the glory and the majesty of God. And this is the truth. If you do not see God's miracles at work today, you're not paying attention. Because God has not taken a nap. He's not taking a break. He's not taking a sleep. God is calling people to himself. People are being saved by the glory and the majesty of God. And there is reason to celebrate. And so we have a call, church, and that is very simply this. We have a call to grow up in the faith. Amen. We have a call to mature in the faith. Right. Well, I've been in the church for decades. Great. Still more room to mature, is there not? True. And so, man, we all are there. Man, someone asked me the other day, so you're a pastor, so, I mean, you don't answer anyone, do you? I said, homie, I talk to five mentors a week. I don't know what world you're living in. Because here's what you realize. The more you learn about God, the more you learn you don't know about God. And it is scary to me, the trivialities of this world that we are so caught up in. And we deny the eternal God. And so... What this morning is all about, what my goal is this morning is to call you and I, not just you, but you and I, I want you all to understand that, to grow in the faith. And this is going to be Jesus' point because he's going to shift us from the individual in the parable of the soils from last week to the kingdom. We are kingdom-minded people, not earthly-minded people. So before we do that, Let us pray, and we'll dive into our text. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for your word that is true. God, we thank you for your word that is truth. God, we thank you that your word says that we can trust you in all things. God, we thank you for the church that you built by your blood. So, Father God, we ask you to use this time for your glory, for your majesty, for the praise and worship of your name. Now, church, I should pray for me. Pray that I'll be helpful. Pray that God will humble me behind and below his cross this morning. Now, church, I ask that you pray for yourself. Pray that God will open up your ears, your mind, your heart to hear from him this morning. Father God, give me boldness and confidence preach your word this morning. We pray these things because of, your, because of your son's atoning work on the cross through the spirit that's alive and active within all who believe. Amen. Amen. So Jesus, again, sh- has shifted from the individual now to the kingdom. He's shifted our point. Okay, the individuals make up of the kingdom that gather together for the worship and the majesty of God. So understand this, God saving you was bringing you into the redemptive plan of history to build the kingdom of God. Why? For the praise of his name, the praise of his glory, right? And so we come into contact, we gather together, together so that we may glorify God. And when we gather together, what do we see? The glory of God at work within one another. That God, when the people of God gather for the praise of his name, people are called to God. This is what Jesus says. Uh, This is 
Mark chapter 4. We're in Mark chapter 4. Sorry to announce that. Y'all can start spinning there real quick. Mark chapter 4, verse 21 and through 23. This is the word of the Lord. And he said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to ear, hear, let him hear. So this is an example of how God works. This is an example of how the kingdom of God works together. We have seen throughout the book of Mark, because we've read it over and over and over, we have seen what we call the secret Messiah, the secret Jesus. There has been times where Jesus has done something miraculous, and he said what? Don't say anything to anyone. And Jesus always has a different reason as to why he veiled himself from others, right? For the leper, he had a reason why he said, don't say anything to anyone. For the demons, he had a reason to tell demons, don't say anything. Be quiet. And Jesus is reaching the pinnacle of the secret messiahship right here when he talks about the veiling. So let's think about who Jesus is and why he has veiled his message and what is the glory. The whole point of Jesus coming is he veiled himself even in his incarnation, even in his birth. What do I mean by that? The king of kings was not born into a palace. He was born into a cave. He was not born with many servants around him. He was born where there was the only people to cheer him on in his coming were the outcast shepherds. He came as a humble, poor son of a carpenter. He was not born attractive that anyone should desire. His looks were not desirable. That's Isaiah chapter 53. So for those of you that were like, he just called Jesus ugly. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. And so Jesus is not attractive to us by his looks. He is attracted to us. He is attractive by what happens, the cross of Jesus Christ. So what do we see in John? I will call all men to myself when I am high and lifted up. What is he talking about there? He's talking about the cross. The cross is the saving grace for the true believer and his repugnant, Amen. disgusting image for those who are perishing. Amen. And so the disciples do not understand. I, I find it funny how much of a Pharisees we become when we read the Gospels. How do these guys not get it? And like, we're so smart, right? It's hilarious to me, right? Yeah, humility is amazing when reading the Bible, I'll tell you that. And so this is the message of the church. Each and every morning you wake up, you preach the gospel to yourself. Do you know who needs to hear the gospel more than anyone else? You do, right? Because I know when I wake up, man, I I know I want to think about my day. And no, what do I need to do, man? I'm waking up and I'm thinking, God, this is your day. And God, I am your servant. And God, I want you, I want you to Humble me beneath you so that I may be a servant of you. Amen. And so this is the cross, because what am I saying? I want to deny myself so that you may be preeminent in all things. And so what Jesus is doing here, he's talking about this, this light, this light that has been put under plastic. It's been veiled. And he's saying, no, 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 you're going to see. You don't understand now. And what are we going to realize? Mark is going to bring this out. We don't get it. And he's going to get to that high point. You are the Christ. You are the Son of God. Blessed be you, bar son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then what does he do? He starts to talk to him about the cross, and they're like, Jesus, you can't say that because that's not you. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Yep, true. You see, so many of us think of the cross as just something that has been done, when in the cross is actually how we think and live through our lives. So why is this important to us? Why is this important? Realize God will veil his glory. He will veil his truth for certain purposes. So so what does this mean? The hardest thing thing for the church to understand is what? Suffering. How can a good God allow me to suffer? And what Jesus is saying here, there are things that are veiled that will soon become true. Where do we see this picture? How about Good Friday? Good Friday isn't good until what? We get to Sunday. So on that cross, suffering, destruction, 
pointless cruelty, not going the way we all planned. But what? Sunday is coming. So, so let me share with you what that looks like for your life and for my life. You may be in here this morning and there may be a deep struggle in your life that you're walking through and you may be asking, God, why are you doing it this way? And I gotta tell you, Sunday's coming. And I'm gonna say this because I love you enough to say this and it's kind of offensive, but it's gonna be good for you. Here's here's what, you and I are on a need-to-know basis. Did you know that we're finite, he's infinite? Did you know that he's already... He's already gone before us tomorrow. Do you know why? Because he's outside of time. He's already constructed his whole plan for tomorrow. And so if you don't understand why things are happening, recognize that it is not about you being able to see. It's about you being able to trust. Amen. Do you know why? Do you know why? Where did I get this? Look at what the text says. Those with ears, let them hear. Why didn't Jesus say those with eyes, let them see? Because faith comes from hearing, hearing from the word of God. So when things are awry, when things are not going the way we want, when things are not going the way we expect, when great suffering comes, where do we go? We go to what the Bible says, the promises of God. Amen. This is this is that veiling of glory. And here's what 2 Corinthians chapter 4 promises. It will all make sense in glory. Because you will be in the glory and the majesty of God. And so realize, he is the creator and we are the creation. Which tells us what? And I want you to understand this. When we look at the cross, everything makes sense. When we look at our world through the lens of the cross, everything makes sense. So do you know what we ask one another? Are you despairing during this time or are you marching in confidence in the word of God? Beloved, you may not know the reason why things are happening, but you know the one who is in charge of all things and you trust in him and so you walk in the confidence of him. This is the point. And this is, and we saw this last week, right? The kingdom of God grows. How does it grow? It's this little seed thrown onto the ground. The soil takes root and the word of God does its work. So preach the gospel to yourself. Do you know why? Because there's a lot of darkness in your heart and in my heart. And what are we asking God? God, can you reveal that darkness so we can shine light in it? We drag the darkness of our heart into the light. And this is the point. So Jesus reiterates, if you have ears, then hear. Next point I want you to understand with the, the word here. Here is a very important term in the Bible. Here, H-E-A-R, by the way, here. You will see it 11 times in Mark chapter four. I wonder if that's important to Mark in this section, yeah. right? It makes you think of the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. In the Bible, the word here is always in the intensive action. It means really here. And what really here is connected with is obedience. So if you hear and do not obey, you don't actually hear. Remember I said last week that's hear versus listen in our culture. They're saying hearing and obedience are directly connected. If you hear and are not walking, you're not actually hearing. James makes this point, right? What good is it to hear the word of God and not do what it says? You are a two-faced man. And so this is what Jesus is saying. If you have ears, then hear. Verse 24 through 25. And he said to them, pay attention. Again, hear, listen. I want you to understand. Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added. For the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Did this just like mess everyone up in our reading plan? Like was everyone like, that's weird. He who has not, what little he has will be taken away. But Jesus, you're supposed to give me things. You're the giver. Why are you taking away? So how do we understand this? Always realize the Bible has answers for your questions. There is great context in this. Did you see it? First of all, here's what you do. When you come to a passage, especially a narrative that you don't understand, your first question is what? Who is Jesus's audience? Who's Jesus talking to? 
he's talking to the disciples. He's no longer talking to the crowd. Remember, he already said he took away the disciples and he explained the parables, and he's continuing in that explanation. So who is he talking to? He's talking to the disciples. He's separated out those who've come to church for the show, those who've come to church to feel good, those who have no interest in doing anything, those who want everyone else to do the work so they can just stand on the sidelines and cheer. Jesus has separated those guys out. So this verse serves as what? A warning to the disciples. This, serves as a, this verse serves as a warning to you and to me. So what does he mean by those who have little, it will be taken away? Who did this remind you of? Immediate context. The soil two and the soil three. Remember, the seed takes root for just a short amount of time, and it's either choked away or burned away. This is who he is talking about. And what does those two soils have in common? Immature faith. Jesus is warning right here, this warning to you and to me is be very cautious of shallow, immature faith. So what is shallow faith? What does that look like? It's those who refuse to see the complete majesty of God. If you don't see the majesty of God, the whole things of this world will cause you to despair and worry. And this is what he is saying. He is telling us, be aware of shallow faith. Satan and the world will eat shallow faith for breakfast. Satan and the world will eat shallow faith for breakfast. Shallow faith is of no use to the church and is a mockery to the world. Godly marriages do not grow up in shallow faith. They grow in deep rooted godly faith. Godly friendships do not grow up in shallow faith. Godly friendships grow out of the desire to drive one another to the word of God through serving one another. Godly churches do not grow from shallow faith. They go they grow from a people that have a desire to see the glory and the the majesty of God manifested at whatever the cost. So how do we grow up in the faith? How do we mature in the faith? Here's point one. The quickest way you want to mature in your faith is by serving and loving others through the word of God. The quickest and most surest way to grow up in the faith comes from humble service to one another. It's easy to talk the big talk. And I'm preaching myself, realize that, because I got to do a lot of talking in my job. It's easy to talk the talk. It's much more difficult to walk what you are preaching. What will faith therefore inevitably do when we actually start to walk what we are preaching? It will inevitably call us to go lower in order to serve others. This is what this means. So what does that mean for us? The church does not exist for your comforts, for your feel good. It exists for the glory and the majesty of God. The church is not about you and it's not about me. It's about the glory and the majesty of God. How do I know that? John 3.30, we must decrease so that he may increase among us. Next, how do you mature in faith? You must grow in the knowledge of God through his word. To know God's word takes time and it takes energy. It takes hard work work, hard labor. This is what the writer of Hebrews says. This isn't my words. This is God's words. So he says this, some of you by now should be teachers, but instead we got to continually go over, over basic doctrines. You should be on solid food, but you're still drinking milk. So how, how, do we go from, how do we go from the milk to the solid food? It goes this way. When we start feeding one another the word of God, because you know why? Then you start eating with your kid and you grow up in the faith. Which brings us to our next point. Maturity does not happen alone. If you were to say to me, man, I'm going to mature in God without the church, I'm going to say, then you're never going to mature. I've never met a mature Christian that said, I did it outside the faith. I always meet the train wreck of faith that said, man, I tried to do it on my own, and it destroyed and wrecked me. Maturity happens amongst other believers. And finally, we should be very concerned to have such a great treasure and never spend it. 
we should be very concerned that we have such a great treasure and never spend it. And by the way, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about the word of God and the gospel. It is incredibly dangerous, church, to know the gospel and it never move you. It is incredibly dangerous for the gospel to never shape you. It is incredibly dangerous for the Bible to never challenge you. That is dangerous waters. It is incredibly dangerous to come to church every week, to come to home group every week and never be changed, never be challenged. It's incredibly dangerous to think that we receive God without enjoying his blessings, his church and his word. Because this is how God has instituted your maturity, through his word, through his church. That's it. His word points to his church and his church points to his word, ultimately glorifying God. God in all things. So who is this group? Who is this group that have little and it will be taken away from them? It is those who have walked in obedience with God out of duty rather than grace and love. Who's this sound like? The Pharisees. And it it drives me crazy that everyone talks about Pharisees as as though they don't exist. Man, they never miss a Sunday. It's those who said, God, you owe me. How do I know that? There is this same term will be taken away from you is used somewhere else in Jesus' sermons. In Matthew 21, he says this to the Pharisees. This is his message to the Pharisees. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing fruit. Who is it that has so little? It is those who have thought that they have earned God's favor. So who does the taking and who does the giving? God does. And this is the light here in this passage. And so realize God calls us, do not be so content in your faith to never grow and go deeper. And this brings me to something, y'all, that just, I want to just have this conversation just as a brother in Christ with you, not as your pastor, but as just a brother in Christ. As someone who, like you, desires the majesty of God to be on great display, not only here, but to all corners of the world. As someone like you who has fasted often, who has wept frequently, who has pleaded with God in prayer for the glory of his name in countries where God's name is never heard of. I know we are all like that. I know you have fasted and prayed and wept that God's name be to the unreached people of this world. So I know that. And I want to say to you, this verse right here, those who have little, it will be taken away, just broke me. Because why? We live in a country, in a culture, in a time in history where we can have some of the best theological minds at our fingertips with a snap of our fingers. And we have done nothing with it. That we are more impressed by Netflix and YouTube and the Kardashians than we are with the glory and the majesty of God, that we find greater satisfaction in those things that will burn away and be destroyed at the coming of our Lord. The problem is not that we do not know things, it's that we have great joy in all the wrong things. The word of God stirs our affections. And let me tell you, of all the sinners, I'm the foremost. I know there's been times where I have found worry and joy in the things of this world. And what does this call us to? Grow deeper, press into God. And so we must never pit the knowledge of God and the faith of of ourselves against one another. Oh, don't learn about the Bible. You'll become like those Pharisees. Paul didn't agree with that. Let me give you a text. Romans chapter 11. Oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable are his ways. What good is it to possess such little of an unlimited God? It's of no use. The more you know about God's goodness, God's justice, God's wrath, God's glory, God's majesty, the more you grow in him. We are way too interested in the trivial things. And this was the plight of the Pharisees. God, we've got the church on lockdown. You go take care of the world. And Jesus said, no, no, I came for my church. I came to call those who are mine. They found everything else more exciting than the glory and the majesty of God. We have a great savior We have a great Savior, and we must never be content to know so little of him. We must never be so content to only walking a few steps with him. You have a great treasure, church, and that treasure is Christ. 
spend that great treasure on the glory of God in your life and do not be content with so little of it. Verse 26 through 29. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man would scatter seeds on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself the first blade, then the ears, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. So what's the next logical question? How in the world does the kingdom of God grow? How in the world does the church grow? And we saw this last week, right? How does the church grow? How do you and I grow? When the seed is scattered and the word of God, the seed of God takes root and does work in our hearts. When the people of God realize there's no other answer for a dying world than thus says the Lord. And thus says the Lord is not about telling people how to fix your life, the do's and don'ts. It's about making Christ preeminent, making God, the pinnacle of our life, sacrificing everything on the throne to see God's word take root in even the most unreached places. Amen. And to those that say the preaching and teaching of God word, God's word sounds like a bad plan, those people who say that are immature people that don't know God's word and therefore don't know God. There is no formula. There is no this or that. It is by God's word. Faith comes from hearing, hearing from the word of God. And this is what he's doing. He's answering the how. And isn't this amazing that this just connected so well with our reading plan? Like I couldn't have planned this even if I tried. What did we read? And your home group leaders, I know they told you this. Monday night, y'all are lucky because you guys get just to test to make sure y'all listen. But everyone else, your home group leaders told you that Book of Romans wrote, written by Paul is a missionary support letter, which means what? Paul's writing this to ask the church of Rome for money so he can continue on proclaiming the gospel to the farthest corners of the world. That's the whole point of the book of Romans. And Paul has a question that he is trying to get them to answer in his own mind. This is what he works through all the way through chapter 10. So you're going to see this. So if you missed it this past week, you'll see it again. And it is this simple fact. How can those who have denied Christ, how can those who have traded his truth in for life, how can those who worship idols, how can they come? Come near to Christ. And Paul totally slaps us in the face and reminds us there are no good people and bad people. There are only those who don't know Christ and those who do. There's only the crowd and the disciples. We do not get to say there are bad people. For what does Paul say in Romans 3? There's no one good, no, not one. There's no one righteous. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so you and I have one hope and one hope only, Christ. And the world has only one hope, and that is Christ. And so the book of Romans radically destroyed us in ever thinking there's bad people out there. Why? Because it says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And where do we put our faith? Our faith and our trust is in Christ. Could you imagine writing a missionary support letter and starting off with, and they have exchanged their truth for a lie. And then he goes on to say, here's how we are going to reach the most unreached places. We're going to preach Christ and him crucified. This is it. And so they're asking Paul, Paul, why are you sacrificing everything to go to the farthest reaches of the world? He said, because Christ came from heaven and he called me. And so I'm going to go call these people to know Christ. This is justification by faith alone, that we are counted righteous. And did you notice what he said in Romans chapter 1, verse 11? The obedience of faith. That's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm doing this is because I want to see the glory of God in the most difficult of places. And so we realize that salvation is not done by the choice or the will of man. Salvation does not happen by the choosing of man. Paul says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, some plant, some water, but God does the growth. John chapter 1 talks about it's not done by the will of man. It's the great salvation of the Lord. John chapter 3, the Spirit goes where it pleases. This is the glory of God that he calls Everyone, he calls people to himself through the praise and worship of his people. And then he says this last part in our text. He says what? 
that the sickle comes and the harvest is here. Here's what we must understand. When judgment comes, this is a way of God bringing people to himself. God uses judgment to bring about salvation. Well, that sounds backwards. Well, again, take a look at the cross. Judgment, salvation are always connected all the way throughout the whole Bible. Passover, killing of the firstborn brings salvation to his people. Judgment and salvation is part of God's sovereign plan. Judgment will often separate out false believers and the true believers will step into the majesty of God. So what do we say to those that say, I love Jesus, but I'm not too crazy about his church. I love Jesus, but I have no desire to be with God's people. Then they truly do not love God and truly do not love Christ. For Christ came for his church, the true church, the bride of Christ. And let me tell you, Christ does not come to his bride to stay on the porch while his bride watches TV in the house. She loves him. To love Christ is to love his church and to love his word. Verse 30 through 34. And he said, with what can we compare to the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it's sown into the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests on, in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. I love this fact. This small little seed grows up into this magnificently big tree. Does that sound like something you and I know? The smallest of things in the kingdom of God often build into the greatest things of God. I think you and I are so obsessed with these big, grand, great things because we, and then we always never get there because we never ever focus on the little tiny things God has commanded us. We never see the big things because we never see the little things. Um, I don't often do this, and in fact, I really struggled this week. I talked to as many men as I could who have preached, but it, were, it fit for this whole view. And I want to tell you a story. Um, and I, I say this not to put me on display, but to just to share you what happens when a little tiny thing, and you trust God, just like that farmer who went to sleep, what happens? Um, a few years ago, I was in my office, and Vicki, I'm sorry, I didn't give you a warning. I'm going to use your name, but I'm going to use your name. Vicki came into my office, and she said, I want to go save babies. I want to go save the unborn, and I want you to help me. And I said, ah, great, go ahead. You're the church. Go ahead and get it. She said, awesome. Will you come with me? And I froze, and I was like, gosh, I've got so much to do. You know how much I've got on my plate, Vicki? She said, can you make time? And so I thought about it, and I froze, and it was probably only five seconds, but I realized this one thing. I said, you know, when I have children and grandchildren, and they ask me, what did I do to stop one of the most horrendous evils of my time? I don't want to tell them I posted something on Facebook. I wanted to stand against evil. And so I said, all right, I'll come stand on the corner through, gosh, it's been cold, it's been hot, it's been, Debbie, I know you and I did raining one time. Um, it, it's, it's nuts. And let me tell you what it's like on the sidewalk. I wish I could tell you it's this great thing where like, you know, the whole building just crashes, right? But you get a lot of hellos with like one finger, one particular finger, if you know what I mean. And um, so about a week ago, I was cleaning my house um, and I get this email. And most of the time when I get emails, do you know what they are? They're usually trying to sell you on like a cleaning service or something like that. So I usually don't even open them. But this one I just happened to open. And this is what it said. And this is direct quote. I'm not making this up. It's direct quote. It says this. Hello, Pastor Scott. My name is Daniel. You and I met a while ago. We met outside of a Planned Parenthood office that you and your sister in Christ were providing other options besides Planned Parenthood. To be quite honest, we were planning on getting an abortion. We didn't feel the time was correct. We didn't want to ruin our plans. Little did we know that's been part of the plan the whole time. As soon as we walked into Planned Parenthood, I immediately felt the Holy Spirit convict me. I felt it say, get out of here. What are you doing? This isn't the way. 
As soon as I felt that, I texted my girlfriend and said, we have to leave. Let's get out of here. She agreed. You and your sister in Christ gave us a flyer for alternative offices that would provide more pro-life solutions. We went to the office you recommended and heard the heartbeat. That was all it took. We immediately decided to keep our baby. I'm pleased to inform you that my girlfriend at this time is now my wonderful wife. God blessed us with a son 12 days ago. His name is Emra, born 6 pounds, 12 ounces. I cannot thank you enough for being there. Our boy is healthy, and we're serving God in a local church. Thank you for listening to God and reaching out to us. God bless you. Do you know what I love about this story? Mark, do you know what I love about this story? It didn't take a seminary degree to do that. Isn't that the best part of that story? I I love that. All it took was me saying, fine, I'll give up a few hours for the glory of God, and I'm going to go to bed. I don't even remember this man. Couldn't tell you what he looked like. I love that. Here's the point. That's why, here's why I tell you this story. Because, friends, it does not take some grand degree. It doesn't take some grand position. It takes a mustard seed of faith to say, God, I am trusting in you. I'm walking in faith. God, use, you, use me for your glory and majesty. My friends, lordship is not a lip service calling Christ. It's not a lip service. It's following Christ at whatever the cost. My friends, if you are concerned with doing something great, then first trust God in the smallest of things. Two hours here, two hours there, and allow God to grow your faith the size of the mustard seed into something great. Christ was never worried about the size. He was always worried about the faith. And so I don't know what yours is. I'm not sure what your ministry is that God has called you to, but my encouragement to you is do it and do it all to the glory of God and let God grow it into something great. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for your word that promises us that you who began a good work and you will see it to completion. God, that you're growing us, that you're maturing us, you're calling us to go deeper so, God, may we constantly be sensitive to you. And may we always cry out every morning, God, send me, I am here. So, God, we love you, we worship you. Praise things in your son's holy name. Amen.